Hello, friends and listeners. Before we get into episode 26 of Aftermath, I want to let you know that we have launched a fan club on Clubhouse. Uh, Clubhouse is a social audio app based on your voice where people around the world can kind of come together to talk and listen and learn from each other in real time. We will be having a, a group room or chat this coming Wednesday around 6 p.m., and so we'd love for anybody to jump in to ask any questions about episode 26 or the show in general, or just have a discussion about Aftermath, what you like the most, what you'd like to see more of. Um, we're going to be there. So again, all you have to do is download the app onto your device. And this Wednesday at 6 p.m., we'll be having a, a, a chat and you just need to search for Aftermath in the app. The second thing is we asked you all to do us a favor and rate us. Uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, and a lot of you have done that. We've seen lots of increases in ratings on Spotify and a few other places, and that's really helpful for us. If you haven't already, we would appreciate you going in and, and dropping us a rating on your, your favorite podcast app. And lastly, of course, if you want to follow us on social media and you haven't already yet, you can reach us on Instagram at Fire Pit Creative Group Official, on Facebook at Fire Pit Creative Group, on Twitter at Group Fire Pit, and on YouTube at Fire Pit Creative Group. We hope you enjoy episode 26. Fire Pit Creative Group presents Aftermath, Episode 26, Eventide. They met in the early evening, not far from the common area. Gabriel said the alcove was only minimally surveilled. The cameras only see citizens coming, not going, Gabriel pointed up. The microphones can't distinguish voices because the air recycler makes too much noise. Danielle's gaze went from the ceiling to Gabriel. You dyed your hair. Danielle reached for him, but stopped herself from touching his cheek. We'll go to my compartment this time. Gabriel told the project administrator. It's not much, but... Danielle, I found the videos. He gazed up and down, as always, taken aback by Danielle's beauty, the way her colorful uniform fit her slender form. Danielle followed Gabriel at a distance, cautious about whom she made eye contact with in the winding corridors. She entered Gabriel's room first. Prince had backed into the compartment that was half the size of Devenu's, with visible piping and exposed electrical equipment in the walls and ceiling. A rusty wash basin leaned against one wall. There was no restroom or shower stall. Gabriel leaned against a cracked wall patched with dry spackle. You wonder where they all go. Gabriel followed Devenu's glance from corner to corner of the little cell, up to the tubes and wrapped circuitry overhead. The plumbing, the conduits. They go up. But all the generators are down below, right? Below the lab, down in the squalor with the refrigeration units. I hadn't thought about it, Gabriel. Danielle sat on the modest but made bed. Yes, you have. But maybe you don't want to know the answer. Danielle swept the tresses of her blonde hair away from her forehead. She reached for the concealed zipper at the nape of her uniform. I thought you might want to watch the reels first. Gabriel's face was expressionless. He turned toward an old square tube television with rounded edges. Wires protruded from the back of the device, jammed into a plastic box dangling nearby. An old power plug fit into couplers, then into another unit sitting on a salvaged, scratched wood table. Reels? Danielle looked perplexed. There's more than one? 
Gabriel nodded. Confidential videos in the archives. A transmission Jacquees did from Iceland. Another at the United Nations. Danielle took a deep but stunted breath. She leaned forward on the bed. Show me. It took Gabriel a few minutes to start the video. The digital film transfer was better than Devenu expected. A few false starts and frames of cyan. Then, an abrupt beginning to the Parisian talk show. The host, an elegant, middle-aged brunette, welcomed the audience, told a few jokes Danielle didn't understand. Laughs. Applause. Danielle turned to Gabriel, who sat up in the bed behind her. Parlez Francais? Gabriel tilted his head to the side, suggesting he understood enough of what was being said. Danielle turned back to the screen as the host welcomed a performer, Sis Kapesh and the non-binary robots. The band was led by a tall... woman or man, Danielle was unsure. The singer dressed from neck to toe in a peach-colored outfit that had all traces of gender. A mechanical apparatus approximating a microphone fit over the performer's mouth and around their head like an oxygen mask. A long, scarlet cable perforated from between the singer's legs, stretching into a nearby bank of synthesizers and mixers. What the hell is this? Danielle asked. Your father is the next guest, Gabriel smiled. Do you want me to? No, that's all right. Danielle watched as Sis Capish writhed half mechanically, half frenetically, like something in the throes of dying or else being born. As Capish sang in a language Danielle didn't recognize, a band of three blue chrome robots played instruments in the background. The rhythms were industrial, but Capish's singing was melodic, exciting. It's Czech, Gabriel said. Something about the death of flesh, the use of automatons, and, um, intercourse with machines. Danielle turned, looking at Gabriel over her shoulder. It's a metaphor, he added. Not intercourse like, uh, but I mean, like with the central processor, Danielle finished for him. She turned back to the video, saw flashing, kaleidoscopic images blanket the stage. Something like that, Gabriel agreed. It's a little strange. But beautiful, Daniel said, watching Sis Kapesh descend into the stage out of view. Their robotic bandmates were lifted upwards, ascending into the television studio's ceiling, out of view of the cameras. The harmonies, and the foresight, the sensitivity. The talk show host announced the next guest as Jacquees Devenu, prominent Strasbourg dentist, or radical centrist conspiracy theorist. Applause erupted as Danielle's father emerged from behind a violet curtain. He was taller, more handsome than she remembered. His distinguished nose didn't seem as big, where his skin was tan, his cheeks full, his chin square. Papa. The applause died abruptly as Jacquees Devenu took his seat. Stories of dentists finding film, poison, secret devices in their unsuspecting patients' teeth have long been at the core of modern conspiracy. Forgive me, ideas, the host insisted. This got a protracted laugh from the crowd. You've put your career, your reputation on the line to resurrect long-debunked conspiracy theories from the mid-20th century. Of course, Jacquees smiled broadly across narrow lips, but few had the skills to develop the film to test the chemicals or the connections to investigate such things. He was charming, speaking in both French and affected English, as if intentionally speaking to a broader audience than those in the studio. The host rolled her eyes to more applause. Danielle's father touched on the success of his dental practice, what he found in his patient's teeth, unusual devices that showed up on x-rays, microfiche he developed. So you extracted and examined these devices without your client's permission? The host asked. No, there were signed indemnities, Jacquees insisted. There were disclosures. The camera moved in close to Danielle's father. Could the audience see what she saw? His defiance? His anger? And supposedly you found, what? Mind control devices? Film of aliens meeting with this country's premier scientists? I mean, doesn't this all sound crazy to you? I mean, it should. Jacquees's jaw tightened. He looked at the audience quickly, glared at the host. I never said they were aliens. His words were only half audible through dull snickers and mumbles from the crowd. 
and I never implicated anyone. Never. But you made allegations. No. I made inquiries. I consulted with experts. Well, were the experts conspiracy theorists, like you? I have acquaintances in the Paris-based arm of the Theosophical Society. The host raised a sculpted eyebrow in close-up. The crowd laughed on cue. The Theosophical Society has a long history of... <clears throat> Jaquise paused, gazed off camera, his voice trailing off. Danielle heard Gabriel inhale and exhale behind her. It doesn't get better. Do you want me to... No, I need to see it, to understand why he believed, what happened, what the world did to him. On the screen, the image switched to a side view of the host and Danielle's father. Isn't it true you made a report to the Direction General? the host asked. How, how did you know that? Jacquise's flushed skin turned bone pale. The picture focused on his eyes and raised brows. Roll it! The show's host could be heard off camera. While Jacquise Devenu fidgeted uncomfortably, a recorded audio played inside the studios. The camera focused on the reactions of the audience, curious, concerned, condemning. This is Sea to Shining Sea, broadcasting from the heart of an underground bunker in Las Vegas, Nevada. A deep voice announced on the speakers, We're on the line live with one of our regular callers all the way from Strasbourg, France. Dr. Mirabolus, are you there? Dr. Mirabolus, Daniel stood. What is this? It's a radio show, Gabriel explained. They used to be popular as outlets for various political interest groups. This is one from the United States. It's specifically focused on paranormal experiences, alien encounters, alternative histories. Danielle closed her eyes. She listened to her father's recorded voice as he furtively explained that after finding curious photos and electronic equipment in his patient's teeth, he reported his findings to intelligence authorities. He was told to meet an inspector at the Strasbourg Cathedral. When no one showed, he said, I returned home. My apartment was wrecked. So was my office. The recorded audio ended with a hiss. Danielle opened her eyes, saw the talk show host grinning at her father, who scowled, blue eyes piercing, not unlike her own. Well, the host chortled, Dr. Mira Bullis. She paused. The audience erupted in a burst of laughter. Isn't it true that since you went on that radio show, your employees and your dental practice left? That they have refuted your claims of... No, no. Jacqui slammed his hand on the arm of the chair. They were... I had to let them go. I, I had to. It's possible they were the ones who wrecked the office, or maybe they were working with whomever was behind this. The host rolled her eyes again. Right. And of course, you've lost your patience, or have been sued by others, and... She paused, interrupting herself. I mean, was it worth all this to... I don't suppose you brought any proof with you to verify these extraordinary claims, hmm, Dr. Mirabellis? The camera slowly moved closer to Danielle's father. She saw perspiration forming between familiar lines etched in his otherwise smooth forehead. Jacquise looked to his left and right, then behind him. He stared directly at the camera, at the audience, those watching in the studio, and remotely. I have the evidence. I have it all. But you won't show it. You won't play it. It's more exciting, more entertaining for your corporate masters and greedy advertisers for me to be the story, the delirious, anxious agitator, the conspirator. Fine. Jacquise Devenu stood. The camera panned up abruptly so that overhead boom microphones entered the picture frame. You can have your slobbering fools and your canned laughter. It's not like there's anything, everything, meaningful at stake. With that, Daniel's father walked swiftly but assuredly from the center stage of the television studio. The show's host rose from her chair and clapped in mock appreciation. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the very handsome but notorious Dr. Mirabellis, I mean, Jacquise Devenu. Danielle knelt by the curved screen, her smooth face close. He was determined. He... He believed. He really did, didn't he? Gabriel rolled off the bed, walked over to Danielle. What do you mean? Whatever happened, 
He was telling the truth, she stood. He earnestly believed what he found, what he was saying. Danielle. Gabriel wanted to reach out, touch her, assuage her guilt over what happened to her father and how she condemned him. You haven't seen the other transmissions. I'm sure you're right that he believed these things, that he was determined for others to believe them, but you heard what they said about Jacquees contacting the Theosophical Society. So, Devenu shrugged, what's... Gabriel interrupted. The Theosophical Society was a remnant of old world research into pseudo-spiritual, scientific, and philosophical topics. Some of them practice a blend of prominent world religions and occult magic in an effort to, I don't know, become one with God. Don't you believe in God? Danielle's expression was practiced to elicit a response. That's not my point. The Theosophical Society were researchers and practitioners of hermetic and esoteric philosophy, the occult, and paranormal. What do you mean? Danielle asked. Like ghosts and seances? Exactly. By the 21st century, their legitimacy was null, their membership mostly underground. The world's patience for such things had yielded to science rather than the supernatural. So what does that have to do with my father, what he found in the course of his practice? If your father was a member of the Theosophical Society operating in France, maybe he concocted all of this to, I don't know, give credibility to what the society and other organizations believed. Maybe he did it for money or notoriety or you think he staged break-ins? Danielle, I didn't say that. The project administrator crossed her arms in front of her. She looked at Gabriel, then back at the television. Show me the rest. As Danielle watched Gabriel set up the next clip of video, her mind raced with mixed thoughts, out-of-place memories of her youth. Her father, restless, always trying to gather information about the Phoenix Project, its origins, architecture, the organization of the various citizen sections, and the membership of the Shadow Council. Too many times he was apprehended by law enforcement for being where he shouldn't be. He always had a prepared excuse. Danielle reflected on her mother, a woman whose touch she remembered better than her face or features. As a baby, Devenu was cared for by hired personnel and her father's friends from the lower decks. Around the time she turned two, her father introduced her to the radiant blonde woman, Danita, as his girlfriend. Later, Danielle would learn that Danita was a prostitute. She and Jacquees exchanged information, food, and supplies. Despite the circumstances of their arrangement, Jacquees always spoke fondly of Danita, with a romantic air as if her affection sustained him even when she wasn't there. She supported him in his cause to expose his shadow council and the central processor. When Danielle was four, Jacquees brought Danita to live with him. Danielle figured out on her own that the yellow-haired woman was her mother. She remembered the woman's calloused hands in contrast to her soft cheek and fine chin. Her mother spoke French with a Swiss accent. To Danielle, Donita was Ma Cunari, and Danielle was Lite Sparve. The Shadow Council ruled that Danielle's mother was unfit to care for her. After all, the central processor forbade those of Donita's status to conceive. Doing so was a violation. How could she care for a husband and child? Donita was banned from Jacquees and Devenu's living quarters. Danielle's father protested and pleaded with the Council. He demanded a hearing where he promised to cease his antisocial behavior, to reform and support the citizenry and accepted social order dictated by the central processor. Danielle was only four, but she never forgot the ferocity of Jacquees' plea, nor the coarse language he used. There was something about the way her father spoke that made her realize it was all an act, a practice performance, not unlike that she saw on the screen in Gabriel's room. Jacquees was well disposed to feign, protect, and deceive. Danita was sent back to the squalor. Jacquees disobeyed the council and continued visiting her, sometimes bringing Danielle along to that place that reeked of detergent, antifreeze, body odor, and animal fat. Over time, Danielle grew to hate visiting her mother, rejected Danita's clinging to her. Trust your father, Danita told Danielle on one of their last visits. He may seem troubled, but everything he does is to shine light in the darkness. Danielle did not understand then, but was now starting to question why. Here, Gabriel connected some wires, then pressed a button on a console. 
A close-up, washed-out image of Jaquise Devenu filled the screen. This one was more pale blue and deep blue than black and white. The contrast was too high, magnifying a graininess in Jaquise's shorn, whitening hair and unshaven face. This one is a live internet feed, Gabriel told Devenu. Not long after the talk show, your father basically disappeared. What do you mean disappeared? He left Straussburg, vacated his offices and apartment, started a website based out of Iceland. Danielle nodded. I remember him talking about that. He said the cold was hard to get used to. Right, but it was also a location from which he could get good reception, transmit to the world, and not face the censorship or authority of the EU and its regulators. EU? Danielle raised an eyebrow. The European Union, before it collapsed. Jacques Devenu's voice, now deeper as a result of chronic cigarette smoking, and tremulous from what Danielle was unsure, came from the machine on Gabriel's floor. Is this thing working? Danielle's father spoke intimately, as if he was there, speaking to them. Uh, for, for Christ's sakes. Okay. This is episode number eight. Eight like the sign of infinity. The intertwined snake. Whatever. Shit, I'm just happy to be here. You know, happy to be anywhere. Danielle and Gabriel sat at the foot of the bed, their knees close. Gabriel watched Danielle. He sought each reaction illuminated in her eyes, each reflex he would analyze later when he was alone. If you've been following this series of broadcasts, you're up to speed on the forces at work, those who interrupted my discoveries and are probably tracking this video right now. Jacquees spoke swiftly then paused deliberately to flip a rolled cigarette between dry, cracked lips. Well, if you're watching, all you little bureaucrats and tyrants, screw yourselves. Danielle winced. This is more of how I remember him. Thinner, preoccupied, angry. Jaquise launched into a long explanation of research he conducted, interviews with other fellow travelers, as he called them, and experiments in social engineering and seeding misinformation. The only way to expose the Illuminati, the New World Order, DARPA, and those in political power who know the secret knowledge is through a carefully orchestrated campaign of subterfuge, misdirection, and radical nonconformity. If you're a subscriber, I pray you're doing everything you can to disseminate your intel about Nightshade and the experiments they're conducting worldwide at the behest of evil forces like the World Health Organization. Nightshade, Danielle said. Gabriel shrugged. The rest of this is just more of the same. Danielle stared at the recording. He's speaking directly to someone. His followers. Gabriel leaned forward to change the video. Your father certainly wasn't the only person who looked at world events, at what was happening, and had an opinion. He probably sought refuge, solace, from anyone who would listen. Yes, Danielle said. But if he was in danger, why did he come to America? Why was he at the United Nations when it was attacked? He would have been safer... She paused, scanned Gabriel's expression, but didn't find what she was looking for. Danielle took a long, deep breath. She recalled the way her father moved, speedily at times without a care in the world, and at others, openly cautious, deliberate, looking over his shoulder. He was gentle with her, but so animated, difficult, with anyone he perceived as threatening. The same was true of Jacquees' voice, the way he spoke desperately, offensively to law enforcement, his detractors, his warders. But, to Danielle, he moderated his words, speaking only in French, and then, poetically. He was troubled, she said, angry. But that doesn't mean he was crazy. And maybe he was. But that doesn't mean he was wrong. I mean, not about everything. Danielle, you don't have to defend him. Devenu continued, as if she hadn't heard Gabriel. A century ago, if you told the people of the world powers that there were subterranean silos with sophisticated computers and automated robotics to care for their needs for the next millennia, or until resources expired, Gabriel uttered softly, sarcastically. What? The project administrator stepped back. How did you... I didn't tell you about that. Piercing eyes narrowed as if alarmed. Danielle trusted Gabriel. She loved him. She was sure of it. But had she let slip some concealed knowledge? Gabriel stiffened. 
His effort to appear at ease was obvious. Danielle, darling, I told you when we first... I told you that my job, that information comes to me. It practically flows through the law enforcement division. But only the council knows, Danielle countered. Only the central processor has that information. Gabriel shook his head slightly. The dissidents know. Devenu didn't like the way Gabriel said this so matter-of-factly. She knew he was complicated, that he had his own views of the administration of the Phoenix Project. He was a populist, or so she thought. Gabriel cared about all citizens, no matter what their station. He believed in fairness, especially when it came to how the Council meted out justice. Didn't they have this in common? We all have our secrets, don't we? Gabriel had said to Danielle the first time they were intimate. He spoke knowingly, as if giving voice to her own concerns. On the television nearby, Danielle's father, who intermittently called himself Jacques or Dr. Mirabellis, ranted half-coherently about exposing government organizations, scientific arms of the world government, and their underground cabals. The government knows about these... these monsters, Jacques rambled. They're working with the WHO, the Red Cross, and others to isolate them and vivisect them to determine the source of their powers, their hidden strengths, and, and, and if they can be co-opted, controlled. Static interfered with the transmission, distorting Jacques's words. Here, Gabriel fumbled with the switches and connecting wires. Let me cue up the last video, the one from the UN. As Gabriel worked, it was quiet, an awkward moment between them, broken only when Devenu said, You know, you remind me of him sometimes, not in a weird way, but his resolve. Gabriel looked up at Danielle. Do you ever wish... That I hadn't betrayed him, Danielle said, that I didn't confess his crimes to the council? Danielle flashed on her difficult teenage years. Constantly torn between having a life of her own, trying to focus on school, having a few confidants, and dealing with her father's frequent disappearances. After her mother's unfortunate death in an accident in the squalor, her father's erratic and openly defiant behavior escalated. Jacques insisted Danita's death was a suicide caused by the Shadow Council. He was accused of organizing demonstrations against law enforcement and the Council. He published editorials on the Infonet, asking long-settled questions about the location of the Phoenix Project. Were there other projects? Were they underground or on the surface? He was censored, censured, and made unimportant, Danielle explained. I felt sorry for my father, but he was guilty of all the things they said he did. But he was accused of organizing the dissonance. You know that. I know what he did, Gabriel. I don't need you or anyone else to remind me. Yes, I turned in my father. It wasn't a matter of being confused, or self-righteous, or having some secret shame. It was none of those things. His imprisonment led to my reward. I did it because it was the right thing to do, what I was expected to do. Gabriel saw the distance in his lover's eyes. He wanted to help, not harm her. But he knew, intellectually, philosophically, the only way to free Danielle Devenu was to continue exposing the lies she believed. Here, Gabriel pressed a button. There's no sound, but you can kind of make out United Nations Security, Daniel said, leaning forward to read the caption at the bottom right of the screen. The image was black and white. The camera was positioned in the corner of the narrow box of a room. Her rail-thin father slumped in a chair, smoking a cigarette. Another man entered the room, tall, dark-skinned. He looked official, and there was something oddly familiar about him. What is this? Danielle asked, then answered her own question. Some kind of interrogation? Gabriel nodded. Jacques was detained for accessing sensitive areas at the UN without legitimate credentials. Danielle pointed at the screen. He's wearing a press badge and lanyard. Gabriel continued. This guy is the head of security for the United Nations. Jacques nodded at the black man talking to him. The video is from one week before the attacks on Manhattan. A week before the fall. Gabriel nodded. Maybe they were investigating him. Danielle shook her head. He was there looking for answers. He didn't have anything to do with... 
Her voice trailed off as she suddenly recognized the man leaning in, pressuring her father. She touched the screen. Oh my god. That's... This is Charles McGillicuddy. Before Gabriel could reply, a buzzing sound came from the thin electronic box on Devenu's latex belt. She looked down. She was being summoned by the Phoenix Council. When she looked back up, she saw Gabriel peering at the band on his right wrist, a comms device. I have to go, Gabriel spoke quickly. Danielle felt the device at her side. Some kind of emergency? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I have to go back to the division. Of course, Danielle nodded. We can finish this later. Yeah, Gabriel was backing towards the door to his compartment. Um, do you want to get dinner? Danielle walked past the television, closer to Gabriel. He seemed distressed. What's the matter? Nothing. It's nothing. I just... I, I've got to go. Gabriel left the room abruptly, leaving Danielle standing there in the entranceway. She wondered, of course, why the council was being convened at the same time as an emergency in the Phoenix Law Division. She turned back to the image of her father speaking with Charles McGillicuddy, the father of Major Leonard McGillicuddy. She had no idea they knew each other, nor why her father was at the United Nations a week before its destruction, and why he returned. General Castro and Major McGillicuddy climbed the winding stairs. Dr. Bath lingered a few steps behind, turning this way and that, taking in the wide hall, the damaged paintings, now artifacts, hanging crookedly. Castro paused at one floor. Here. He walked down the hall to a row of long bay windows between marble columns. When Bath caught up with the general and the major, he stood near the windows, noticing most of the panes were cracked or entirely gone. A tree limb outside had overgrown, its leaves and stems penetrating the window, entering the building. Vines wound around the curved wood moldings. Dead leaves, decayed nuts lined the windowsill and floor. General Castro leaned with his back to the window. He reached out, bracing Cuddy in Bath's shoulders. An unexpected gesture, to be sure. It does me well to see you, Benjamin stated, as if they had been separated much longer. His robot body simulated a deep breathing sound. His chest rose and fell. General, Cuddy said, these people, the odd fellows, they have everything. Food, medicine. They could help the scavengers in the tunnels. They could... Benjamin raised a hand, politely silencing the Major. They could, but their mission is not ours. We have to be careful. Cuddy looked rejected. We have a duty, sir. I know you want action, Major, and I know your heart's in the right place. But I need your head here, with us. We can't get our simulacra destroyed on someone else's crusade to kill mutants and... Now Cuddy interrupted. We encountered more mutants, rockheads, as we came out of the tunnels. Not a few blocks from here, the mutants and survivors are scrambling into what's left of a row of buildings that got toppled. It's war out there, General. And whether we like it or not, there's no way for us to continue this exploration without getting stuck in the middle of it. Castro paused for a moment, and then continued. Cuddy, I understand. Silvio Jones controls the Rockheads, who are in a conflict with the Morlocks. From what I've seen so far, they're both out to get what's left of the human population, and you've got groups like the... Benjamin lowered his voice. He pointed at the stairs. Like the odd fellows and the scavengers who are out there trying to take the conflict to the mutants. They're just trying to survive, Cuddy protested which is what we would be doing if we were if we were flesh and blood instead of laying in some tank underground, half alive, half whatever. Nearby, Bath gazed out the fogged and dirt-encrusted windows. Cracked light streaked across his simulacrum's pale, pseudo-skin face. Gothic and modern architecture blended, built up, broken down. He muttered, his head shaking from side to side. Such enormous structures and such destruction. For what? And where are all the people? Down here with us? Up here in those shattered high-rises? How did this happen? Bath, Cuddy turned to the other man. You all right? John looked over. He nodded. He's right, Castro said. That's what we're trying to figure out. How did this happen? Who's responsible? 
and how can the Phoenix Project help? Benjamin looked down the hall, saw two of the odd fellows carrying a covered stretcher, the shape of a body under the stained linen cloth. When the odd fellows had passed and were out of earshot, General Castro gestured to Bath and Cuddy. They moved further down the hall, away from the windows. Listen to me, he said. I need to tell you about what happened to me as I came across the bridge. There are other forces at work here. As the sun started its descent outside New York City Hall, General Castro carefully and quietly recounted his meeting with Lieutenant John Running Bear and Professor Iku Kaminari. He described their ride into the Rockhead's gauntlet on what remained of the once prominent suspension bridge. I hope to talk to Silvio Jones, he said, maybe one of his lieutenants or something. I hope to reason with them, at least get some actionable intel about what we're up against. A grave look bent Castro's face as he thought of his own arrogance and what he encountered on the bridge. Benjamin gazed down for a long moment, as if lost in thought. Then he continued, his description of Santa Muerte swift, with little pause for reaction or detailed explanation. Her power was extraordinary. She knew this body was robotic, and yet I could feel her trying to reach my mind. That's impossible, John said. I know what I saw, doctor, and I know what I felt. What's more, she said she knew we were robots, had been following us since Liberty Island. She knew things about me, my past. What things? Bath asked. I don't want to get into it here. We're due to be pulled from the green stream shortly. Benjamin nodded at the windows. Once the sun is down, we're going into the rail tunnel that runs under here. Hopefully we can find some cover for our bodies and Cuddy interjected. What happened to this, what did you call her, S -S Santa Mary? Santa Muerte, Our Lady of the Holy Death, Bath said. She's a pagan saint of some kind in Latin America. Dispatched, Castro said firmly. We'll get into that later. Cuddy nodded in agreement. He looked at Bath, saw the other man was having trouble believing the general's story. Cuddy wasn't surprised. He was having trouble coming to terms with all that had happened all they had experienced in such a short amount of time. Come on, Kasher said. Let's get out of here. The general led them past the odd fellows and scavengers prying eyes. Outside, they crossed into what used to be City Hall Park, but was now an obstacle course. Felled trees and ripped up sidewalk were fashioned into barricades. The trio headed west toward City Hall Station. The sky was a brilliant blue-black, Starless, the mood hid somewhere behind abandoned skyscrapers. Neither the general nor Dr. Bath noticed they were being followed at a distance, but Cuddy was well aware, waiting. Aftermath, a Fire Pit Creative Group production, based on a story created by Rhett Davis, with characters created by Rhett Davis, Warren Davis, Willem de Grief, and Cole Hoopengarner. Written by Warren Davis, with contributions from Cole Hoopengarner and Willem de Grief. Narrated and produced by Cole Hoopengarner. Music by Warren Davis, and video production by Willem de Grief. John Running Bear is based on a character created by Fire Pit Creative Group's close friend, Sam Ashu. The sound effects used in the production of Aftermath are used with permission by the creators and links to these sound effects can be found in the description section of each episode. Please visit our website, aftermathpodcast.net, for updates, original artwork and music, character dossiers, and more. You can also find us on social media, on Instagram at Fire Pit Creative Group Official, on Twitter at Group Fire Pit, on Facebook at facebook.com slash firepitcreativegroup, and on YouTube at Fire Pit Creative Group. Aftermath and its story, characters, music, and artwork are copyrighted by Fire Pit Creative Group.